Welcome, welcome, welcome to the channel, everyone. My name is Olivia Jaegerist, and today I have a very special video for you guys. Maybe not so special for you, but special for me. Uh, I am going to do a tier list video. Uh, hopefully, that will be one of many. I love tier list videos. Uh, I always want to do a tier list video. On the other channel that I go on occasionally, I want to do a tier list video, of my, but decided against it. Uh, but today, I actually get to do a tier list video. And it's going to be so exciting for me personally. Anyway, I mean, maybe you don't find tier list videos exciting. I always find tier list videos exciting. So let's just go right into it. So here we have Attack and Titan characters based on writing. And we have a good chunk of them here. Pretty good chunk of them here. Uh, based on writing, not based on my favorite, uh, not based on which one I like the best, not based on character development, but they are based on writing, how well they are written, and um, more their effect on the story, their, 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 their plot, and whatnot. Um, on the bottom, you will see, actually I'm going to continue to show it now. On the bottom here, you can see NA, okay? That basically means, I got, I got a really, really good tier list I got, or for this. That basically means um, they weren't shown enough, and I'm also not including anything from any spinoffs. So that basically means they weren't shown enough, and that's why I'm putting them there. Um, for example, Rams is a great example of this. Rams is a character that was shown for like four, where, where is he? Where's the little guy? Here he is, here's a little buddy. Uh, and actually Faya too. And Hans? Is that his name? Fra Hans and F Hannah? Hannah and Franz? Franz? Uh, Franz, I think that's what his name is. These guys have, or, you know, they're barely around in the show, so they don't have much, um, you know. Time to develop or really have an effect on the story. Again, this is about how well they are written. Um, again, there is going to be some points for having an effect on the plot, but much, much less than what you would think. So, I, but I got a really, really big list here. I think it's actually 70 characters here, if I'm not mistaken. So, I want to make sure I got everyone, because there's a lot of well written characters that are not really appreciated. I want to make sure I got them in this tier list. And so, I just went completely overkill and got 70 characters. Um, but, so we're probably going to have a lot in the NA category, and I'm actually going to try to weed out as much NA characters as possible in the beginning, so we can really dive into the good stuff, and then I'll start from, you know, top to bottom. So, let's get right into this. So. So. Uh, first, actually, we're going to start off with our, my main NA character. That being Ramsey. I don't know. I just got. I just got to feel for the little buddy. Uh, I don't know why I like him that much, but we're putting him uh, in the NA tier because he has no relevance in the plot. Same thing with. What well, I mean, he does, but not that much. Same thing with uh, Faya, who I thought I just saw. Faya is not here. All right, this guy. This guy's from Lost Girls. Uh, also very relevant and, and from a spinoff so he's going there as well let's see um, here's Faya yeah second second favorite character in this list you know very beautiful young girl so 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 sad I actually say that she has, she has the absolute worst death uh, in Attack on Titan uh, but so 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 unfortunate what happened to her um, and, uh, let's put Hana and Franz in there as well. They were pretty cute together, weren't they? Uh, that did not last long. Where, where's Hana? Hannah. Can't find her. Oh, also this restoration just can also go there as well. <laughs> Alright, um, if I can just find Hana, we can actually, or Hannah, Gelgir? No, I'm actually saving Gelgir. Uh, nope, looks like... I can't find her. Oh, here she is. <laughs> All right, where she was left. All right, so there are the, for what I can see, most for the most part. Oh, and Isabel. Yeah, you're definitely going here. Whew, you don't even deserve to be last. You deserve to be in the middle. Hold on. Let's not separate these two little birds, shall we? All right, so uh, from what I can see, these are the, um, you know, very relevant characters that did not get much writing, but 
you know, are on this list anyway. So let's actually move on to Hanji. Now, most, again, I am a real Jaegerist, but most Jaegers really, 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 really hate Hanji. And honestly, so do I. I hate her a lot. And funny enough, I remember someone saying, well, if Aaron cared about his friends, how come he, how come he killed uh, Sasha and Hanji? Did he, I'm like, wait, he liked Hanji? I hated Hanji so much that I actually forgot that Aaron liked Hanji. That's how much I hated her. But that being said, she is a very well-written character and has a great effect on the plot. So she, uh, she took only eight, eight tier. Because she's not, again, she's more of a developed character when we fully meet her. Um, sort of like uh, Captain America. For example, Iron Man is a character that develops over time. Captain America is a already developed character. Nothing wrong with that. Um, th I mean, Le so is Levi. Uh, so, so a lot of characters, but uh, she um, does not do a lot of developing. There's not that uh, as much. Again, it's not about development per se, but her character lacks depth because we see we don't get much introspective with her, and we, again, so the, the character developments so we don't get that richness to her character and stuff like that so uh but she is still a very good written character her thoughts on the rumbling while i completely disagree with them um and the, you know the, the internal struggle she's going through and, and what it means for the alliance what it means for the people who are against aaron the fandom and the in the real world uh yeah very uh well i should I'll probably just knock her down to the eight here uh all right next person niall doc um Niall Doc, I don't know, man. He he is a good character, uh, but again, we don't really see him that much. He doesn't get that much depth at all. I'll actually, put him. I'll put him in the D tier. Uh, yeah, not an F or fail because again, this is reserved for people who do not get that much screen time. This guy gets too much screen time to be in here. Uh, but he is a good character though. Uh. But not not, not 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 that original, not that depth in depth. Uh, this is Undo, I think, or maybe it's Sophia. I have a hard time seeing. This looks like no. This is so. This is Undo. That's Sophia. Yeah, not that much screen time. Barely opens her mouth. So yeah, this guy. <laughs> you don't know who he is, uh, and he does not get that much screen time. So yeah, there you go. Maybe it's Moblet. No, that's not Moblet. Zeke. Zeke. Yeah, you know where this is going. Uh, Zeke is an S tier. Uh, not only is Zeke's what I preach about Zeke's character is that we hate him at first, and then he, we get an Uno reverse, and then we actually, well, most of us start to not hate him. I hated him for the longest time because he was, I mean, we know that, um, we, first we see Annie. Uh, we see her apologizing to corpse. We see her crying. We see her um, emotional. We see her um, even in uh, Lost Girls, which is not canon, but it still needs to get mentioned. Uh, I think mean, you can do what you will with this, but she expresses, you know, how guilty she feels about it, how she wants to distract herself from what she's about to do tomorrow. In, in Lost Girls One and in Lost Girls Two, she she says that she hopes she didn't have to use a ring and that sort of stuff. And then of course, you know, uh, the whole Marco situation, she obviously felt guilty about in in uh, that chapter. So, and then with Reiner, I mean, we all know how guilty Reiner feels about this. Got very suicidal, uh, you know, had a personnel, had a mental illness, all this other stuff. And then Baratholt, we know because of his um, very beautiful speech in season two. And, I mean, these all look like reluctant people, right? It's what Mikas has said it best in Wild Scrolls. She said, I think you're doing this because you have to, not because you want to. She didn't say that, but I had to add that last part of it. They're doing this because they have to. Uh, Zeke was having a, f a grand old time. He was, you know, killing Mike. Had a perfectly fine time. He took a little bit of time to mock him. Went on, went on to his next kill. Made a game out of the whole charge. Erwin's final charge. That whole, that whole sequence. Made a giant baseball game out of it. Went back to bar. Was lighting up, lighting up cigars. While, meanwhile, uh, cigarettes are in his mouth, like we see here. There's guns in Reiner's mouth, and you know who knows what Annie and Barthol are doing. Barthol's in, you know, the pals or whatever. Uh, and he was just having a grand old time, and I hated his guts, but. Uh, he turned out to be a very, very good reason for this because he was an anti-natalist and he believed that uh, that uh, death is a relief. And and of course, the question I always ask is if you believe that is a relief, why are you still alive? Okay, it makes sense he's still alive because he wants to do the euthanasia plan. He's going to die soon anyway. So that's why he's still alive. That's why he's doing this. That's why he's killing those people. That's why he's fun killing them. That's why he has no guilt killing them because he's because he does not see the value in human life. Only 137, which, and again, 
Which, and I'm, the only reason I'm going to find a little bit of attention here is because it's definitely relevant, relevant to the character. Excuse me. Uh, 137, people, uh, some people are, are upset, rightfully so, rightfully so, that um, it appeared that Zeke changed his mind a little bit too quickly. Like, all like all Aaron, all Armin had to do was show him a baseball, and he, all of a sudden, he believed in the value of human life, and all of a sudden, he changed. Uh, wow. Uh, there's a couple of things about that. Number one, uh, you can you the best best way to argue with someone is not with logic. Okay, I'm sure most people already know this. Again, you're watching this video. You probably are on Reddit. You probably know how logic does not play out that, that well on there. Maybe you're into politics and you know well there. Maybe you're a sports fan and you know logic does not do the best there. It's about the heart of the person. That's what you want to attack the most, right? If you convert the heart, everything else will follow, uh, basically. So he shows him a baseball because the baseball meant something deep to him, and it, and, and it connected some dots in his head. Uh, and also, he his mind was not completely changed. He said explicitly, "I still believe that we didn't do. It. I still believe that in our euthanasia plan, right?" So it's like his mind got explicitly changed. So number one, Armin gave him very, very, very solid logic. Uh, number two. He showed him something deeply personal and meaningful to him, and again, reminded him of those feelings by showing him the baseball. He saw exactly what he needed to saw. These are all forces that we cannot conjure in, in a real debate. And on top of that, he still didn't change his mind. He just saw the value in human life for a little bit, and then he, and then he, you know, he felt a little bit guilty about. He expressed the very first time that's when he feels guilty about killing people. On top of the reason why I like Zeke is because Zeke also demonstrates the difference between wisdom and intelligence. Uh, Zeke is a very, 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 very smart character. In fact, only Hanji is smarter than him, or as smart as him. They're both 11 and 11, and they're both pretty smart. Some can say, well, Erwin's smarter, well, Armin's smarter. You can say whatever you want. Uh, they're all pretty smart. Uh, but he's not that wise, as shown by his plan. And it's, it's, you know, it's really good writing. Very, very good writing. And he does have a character arc, which is really cool. And makes a lot of sense. Again, his character arc is not very, you know, big or, or well thought out. Again, like, uh... What I call, I call it the postmodern character arc, which is probably an improper way of saying it. Let's see. But I think I'm actually probably right, though, by like calling it postmodern. Uh, let's see. Western for all in the late 20th century. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I'm right calling it the postmodern. Yeah, it's the post. What I call the postmodern character arc. And the best way to do the one of the best ways to look at this is um. Stranger Things. Steve from Stranger Things is a great example of a postmodern character arc. You know, bad guy turned good guy, but it's over time and it's nuanced. Uh, Regina from Once Upon a Time, ignoring all the contradictions and plot holes. She's a, you know, traditional postmodern character arc. Eleanor from uh, The Good Place, uh, postmodern character arc right there. So he doesn't really have a, what I call a postmodern character arc. Because it happens suddenly, and uh, it's not like Reiner as an example, which would be Attack on Titan's postmodern character arc. Uh, but it's still very, very good. And this is why I didn't say it's about character arcs or character development. It's about just about well ordering characters and Zeke. It's definitely S tier, and only one per well, only one person is going in uh, S plus because S is supposed to be for superior. So it's only supposed to be one superior. Uh, Next is, um, I forgot this girl's name. I know who she is. I forgot her name, though. <laughs> Damn, it's been a long time. Uh, this lady. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I want to put her in the D, in the F tier. But, um, I don't think I should. Because she didn't really have that much time to develop. And she wasn't supposed to be a real-winning character to begin with. So she's going in the N.A. tier. Mikasa Ackerman. Oh, <laughs> Now, or some of you, God forbid, some of you guys call her Dagasa. Uh, now, most of you want to put her right here. Uh, in fact, maybe some of you guys want to make uh, a, a different category. Uh, worst character. <laughs> Care. Care. This one character? Yeah, worst character ever. Uh, slash Dagasa. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because that's disgusting. Uh, no. Uh, so you guys want to do that to me, guys. She's not developed as much. Uh, I said she's awful. Um, I'm actually going to put her <laughs> in the S tier. Uh, I know, I know, I know. Please, please take your swords away from me. You know that Flynn Rider uh, meme where like he's surrounded by swords? Yeah, please. It, that's how I feel right now. 
Yes. I know. It's a little bit of a spicy take. I am not saying that she, again, just like a Zeke, she does not have a character development and her character arc is not, you know, up to tier. But Mikasa is not a postmodern character. That's why I mentioned the plot. Mikasa is not a postmodern character arc, okay? Mikasa, Mikasa is a great character because she was meant to parallel your mirror since the beginning. I'm, I'm not going to get into why. I mean, look at the, yeah, I would say... Look at the miss. Look at the praying mantis. Look at you know. See you later, Aaron. Or why are you crying? Those are both in the anime and manga. How did your hair get so long? You know, things like that. So I'm not again. I'm not gonna explain my my full reasoning why it is not an argument video. You can be mad. That's fine. You can leave an angry comment if you want to. You can say I got this completely wrong. That's perfectly fine. Um, but I you know I shot videos about Mikasa. I shot videos about Ymir <laughs> and stuff like that. So. And if you want to shoot another one, if you want to, to debate me, that's perfectly fine. You can, you know, email me. You can, you can uh, comment down below. Uh, so you know, so on and so forth. I don't have a Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, but you can definitely get a hold of me, and I will, you know, I will do a de debate with you about this. But Mikasa, parallel to Mirai, Mikasa was also a very, if you look back, uh, she was Aaron's lover, and um, he tones it down more for the anime. I think he went, he went really, like. He, yeah, he went full throttle on the whole love story, but I think he decided, yeah, she needs a little bit more depth in this, so he made, he made her talk with other people and stuff like that. Uh, but she definitely uh, uh, is a, just, I mean, she's a, she's a woman, right? She has these feelings, and she expects you to pick up on hints, and the, the guy's clueless the entire time. Only this time, instead of, you know, uh, sleeping on the couch, you end up genociding 80% of the world, and then still not getting the woman anyway. Yeah, it's kind of depressing. But again, yeah, it's very sad. It brings a tear to most people's eyes. Um, didn't bring a tear to my eye when they kissed, because it was I mean, it was very rushed. Uh, yeah, so I couldn't get into my emotions. But you know, once once the anime comes and paces it beautifully, and the and the music hits in, it's gonna be sweet. Uh, all their songs together that they have, those are all very sweet. I mean, I'll I'll uh, I'll sacrifice anything to talk to. You, all that stuff, very beautiful stuff. So, and of course, um. The fact that her character arc finishes by a dead person. A dead person finishes her character arc by wrapping a scarf around her for the last time. And she also explains to us um, how, and again, we always shrugged off her maxim, oh, world is cool, but also beautiful, yeah, yeah, whatever. But she really, Attack and Titan really showed us that, yeah, the world is cool, but it's also beautiful. And that is the key to um, freedom and happiness. Well, one of the key, of course. Uh, but, well, in that world, yeah, it's the key to freedom and happiness. So that's why I put her the S tier. Is she a, is she a well developed character? Nope. Was she supposed to be a well developed character? Nope. Because if she was well developed, how would she parallel Ymir, right? Because Ymir wasn't a developed character, right? Ymir was a slave to Fritz, and Lika says a slave to Aaron. Uh, so and again, I call I hate I mean before those dogs I called her Mika freak. <laughs> I called her Mika freak. I didn't like her at all. I, I hated her for lots of different reasons. But again, just like Zeke. Pulling in a reverse car at the very end, I was like, oh crap, that's why she was written like this. This makes sense. So yeah, that's why I put her in the S tier. If you don't like it, perfectly fine. Leave your anger comment, get all your get all your anger out. Yes, I know, you know, you didn't get enough hugs, but no, that's fine. You can vent all your rage on me. Uh Grisha Yeager. Um and the, that Grisha video is coming soon. And the reason why I haven't posted it yet is because I want to really do my research on this. Uh but I'm actually going to put him for now. In hmm, no, nah, I have to put him in Naples. Uh, Grisha actually does have the postmodern character arc with a twist. It's done in reverse. <laughs> uh, Grisha is a very naive character. Uh, he he has no clue what's going on, and, and he I think the fan bait the fandom page calls him like impulsive, and he, he can only see the consequences of his actions when they're presented right in front of him. He can't really think that far into the future. I mean, one of the best examples of this is when, after he gets to manipulating Aaron, <laughs> he's like, will this really save Eldia? And I'm like, come on, Grisha, like, are you serious? Uh, he, still, he, just, he still has no clue that Aaron is going to, he's not actually planning on saving Eldia, or that's not his main priority. And he may say, well, how is Grisha supposed to know that? I would say, the dude has been talking about Aaron, about Mikasa and Armin, and all this other stuff. Again, you may disagree with me on that point, but I, I just thought that he was behind the eight ball. He was so, so behind. Uh, but uh, Grisha, 
um, was a horrible, <laughs> very horrible father. But it makes sense why he was. Again, one of the best, the one of the the the, the things that pay attention to most in uh, shows and media is character motivation. The character motivation has to be convincing, um, immersive, and original. Much less than the original style. I'll, I'll relax in the original part. Uh, but it at least has to be immersive and convincing. He's a horrible. He's a horrible dude. Now, the, the, the question that they ask is, why is he so horrible? And he's horrible because hey, he's been oppressed. His sister got killed. His dad was like, hey, that that that's what that that this is a good learning opportunity. Do not call out the walls. You don't live your life in in uh in in uh, in in in, uh, in, pr in prison and you know th this is great and. You know, he knew the Marlians killed him, and then he was mocked about it, about how it was a great learning experience for that guy's sons, Ma Ma Major Gross or Mario Gross, for about, uh, you know, how, how to candle Eldian scum, and so on and so forth. And so, when he has Zink, he's like, of course, we're going we're gonna to take back our freedoms, we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to take in the, the Marlian Empire, we're going to brainwash him. And so that is, maybe not original, per se, but is definitely more original than most character motivations I've seen. And he's not really a bad guy per se. That's the other thing, because it's done in reverse. And so um, we see why he does all this, and he has this bad son. And then he goes onto his next son, um, Aaron. And funny enough, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, you know, we have a bunch of irony. Like for example, Aaron obsessed with freedom, but uh, can, but is the only person who can see an unalterable. One of the only people who can see an unalterable future that he does not particularly like. Pretty ironic. That's again more of a classical way of writing stories. Uh, Grisha, like the, the kid that he wanted to fight for freedom, he manipulated into doing, but he didn't actually want to do that. But the kid he did, but the kid that he didn't manipulate was the kid that ended up fighting for freedom. You know, very ironic stuff. And I, yes, I mean, and, and that's his character. And he actually tells me about the basement at the exact right time. Um, he doesn't tell him about the basement, and it's the only one does this purposefully. And we know he does this purposefully because he knows that Aaron's manipulating him. Because in the manga, we see Grisha looking to the side, and then when we go, when we go on volume 30, we see, oh, he's looking at future Aaron. So, uh, Grisha uh, shows him the basement at the exact right time. And the reason why I keep bringing that up is because this is perfectly consistent, which makes him well written, being a consistent character. Once Aaron. Reiterates the exact elderly restoration restorations policy. We cannot let the fallen die in vain. We have to fight for freedom in our what? Yes, I know we're fine here, but we, we can still attain better things. And so after he says all that, knowing the risk, because again, he's up close and personal with the scouts and, 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 and the injuries and how horrific it is. He sees horrific things happening all the time. And he still goes out there and smiles every time he sees the scouts come back. And he's like, okay, now it's time to show you the basement. Uh, very nice, very consistent. I just, I mean, I just love, I just really, really love how his, his relationship with Zeke. You know, he got a chance to apologize. I mean, that's something that you get. Um, you know, he, and then he, you know, he said, I love you, so to play with you more. You know, very, very emotional stuff, very good stuff. Uh, that's why I put him at the eight tier. I uh, hope I don't get hate for that. This guy, I mean, this guy, obviously. Actually, you know, I'll put him in the D tier, maybe C tier. He has a little bit of depth to him. Um,. I know he has a little bit of a guilt complex about, you know, losing his family and he tries to do good and all this stuff, so uh, he's not, you know, an F, but he's also, he might not be an F, uh, but he's he gets too much screen time to be in the NA tier. Uh, this Undo, yeah, you're irrelevant, so. Marco. Now, hopefully this video is not getting too long. Uh, Marco. Now, Marco... Um, is the does not have the most screen time. And one thing I want, I want to address about Marco is the reason why you don't see him in 139, especially at the end when um, they salute and they see all the ghosts, is because he was never in the Survey Corps. I think people keep, people keep forgetting that he did not want to fight for humanity's freedom, which is fine. Again, I'm not saying he's bad for that. I'm just saying that was about the Survey Corps, the day King of Heart stuff. That was all about the Survey Corps. Marco never joined the Survey Corps. He was going to join the military police. Uh, so, poor guy's had one more mission to do. One more mission, he could have done it. And, unfortunately, you know, that didn't happen for him. Very, very sad. But that that's why he's not in the, 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 the... He might be shorter the last, in the last episode, but that's why he's not in, the, in that flashback where Levi's like, it's what you guys did a K-Hearts for. Uh, but on that quick side note, um, 
Marco's character's not shown that much, but he does give us something really important, right? And I, I really, really hate to get political here, but I'm going to have to for a second. Uh, we're going to shift from the military police to the actual police. Well, not the actual police, but the local police. And we see how, you know, certain things about the police are incredibly corrupt. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, bad stuff happens with the police. And Annie mentions that it's, you know, the, it's the system. And we, I am going to do a military police video. I am going to do a military police video. But basically, um, Marco is really good in how he portrays how someone can do something that is that other people do for selfish reasons very nobly. Not like Marlo does. Marlo has a different mission. But see, Marco's different in a way because... Marlo wants to join the military police to change the military police to do the actual job. Marco wants to serve the king. He wants to serve the king, which is a which as shown is a genuine and noble pursuit. And the only people we see do this are people who want to get into the interior and live a good life. But he's saying, Well, yeah, I'm gonna live in the interior, but my main goal is to serve the king and it's gonna be an honor, and I just wanna do that. So that was a really, really, really cool way of Again, the military police are not that bad. People, people severely overrate the, the, the badness of the military police. Um, and I, I will be shooting a video about that. It's one of my video ideas. Uh, but uh, he shows how you can go into a system that is... is I mean, the military, the military police is supposed to be the bad guy. But he shows a genuinely good altruistic person can go in there. Not only to, to, to change it for the better, but also just to genuinely do their job instead of the king. So I'm going to have to put him um, B+, plus, not A, because he's again, not that much... I mean, he, is, he also has some leadership aspects to him and some sacrificial aspects to him. Not as much as Hondi. Hondi's more fleshed out than him, because just simply because she gets more screen time. But uh, Marco, a really good character. Uh, Peek. Uh, Peek gets... Uh, she can't go here, because she has too much uh, writing, too, too much screen time. Uh, I'll put her in C, I guess. She probably honestly belongs here. Uh, but, you know, we already visit her when she, you know, after the fact... And uh, she's she's not really the main antagonist, even when she does come into the picture. Uh, what we know about her is that she's very perceptive. She's very smart. Uh, she does a lot of human nature. She's not. Uh, she's very she's very brave, but also can be, but also can be very very stupid, as we see in 135 uh, and 136. You know, very you know, whatever. We don't really get that, get that much of her. Uh, but yeah, still a low rank character has convincing character motivation. Not not original by any means, but has convincing character motivation. It makes sense, and you know she's sort of like Amy in a way, but with probably with much less guilt. Uh, I don't know. She stayed at home, and she didn't really, you know, kill uh, bad or innocent people. She kills you know military personnel. So I don't, I don't really know if she feels as guilty as Amy does. Uh, but let's let's do. Uh, Kenny. Kenny's another A care A plus character. Uh, Kenny. <laughs> is um an amazing character because uh he is a villain um and he does not get a postmodern character arc his character arc actually is just like a, what i call the quick spike uh or i probably shouldn't even, i probably shouldn't be make, making all these blockers but uh, i will uh the quick spike which would be mikasa who who you know stays relatively flat relatively flat and then spikes up and kills aaron and then uh, you know moves past him and then marries John, you know, quick spike, and then, you know, for, 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 that's, I completely forgot that about Mika, so that's why she's an S tier, by the way. I completely forgot about that. Uh, that whole nuance between loving Aaron and loving John and having kids, very complex, very well done stuff uh, there. Uh, again, Mika does not, does not get enough praise for that, but she really does deserve praise for that. Uh, yeah, Kenny, um, what was it? Yeah, so, yeah, and like see, you know, flat, 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 quick spike, and then, you know, he develops... Him, same thing. Very flat, very flat, and then quick spike. He spikes up, and he and he and he has his development. Uh, but that's not bad by any means, and I'm sure you can see, you know, how it's not bad looking at this this these characters here. Um, but Kenny is a bad guy who has very convincing motivation, um, an original motivation, since the, his motivation is sort of. Um, not entirely, but but mostly grounded in the actual lore of the story in and of itself. His motivation is that he wants power. Now, is that original? Absolutely not. That's every supervillain ever. But he wants power because it made people compassionate. And he, like Ymir, 
wants to be compassionate, but he's also an evil person. So he had this really cool nuance and depth to him where he wants to be compassionate. He's like, okay, anybody who hit the founder became incredibly compassionate. Maybe me, I'm so terrible, but maybe I even can feel compassion. So he's seeking this noble pursuit through violence. He's like, I'll kill anyone I need to kill to be a good person. And it may, the logic makes sense, right? But then he realizes at the end, right, what Levi said, which I'm pretty sure Levi saying that was inspired by Kenny. I'm almost certain of that. And I'm pretty sure it was also um, a foreshadow to Aaron. Uh, give up on your dreams and die. That's Kenny, right? He had it the entire time, but his true freedom was doing something compassionate. Not when he had the founder. He didn't need the founder to be compassionate. He genuinely, out of his own heart, gave Levi the Titan Serum. And then, of course, we know what happened with that. And then, so his character, he was free. You know, everyone's like, this. and of course, he the, one of the best lines in the show and a, a, a theme of the show. He introduced a theme. Everyone's a slave to something, right? And also, Friends got republished with 139. I do want to bring it up. Friends got republished. Uh, when 139 got republished. Uh, but yeah, so very good character, very very good motivation there. Not around for a long time, but makes the best of every scene he's in. Um, you know, very well written, very good, very original. Uh, yeah, so pr pretty good stuff there. Um, also he shows just like Gabby. I'm gonna hate to bring politics into this, but the you know house Negro, fuel Negro concept. All right, now uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, as you know, you guys probably know. I want to make this video as short as possible. I can't continue rambling. We have 70 characters to do, bro. All right, and I probably have to do three parts of this, but still, this is so exciting. All right, so Hannes, I'm gonna put Hannes in the same layer as Peak. Uh, you know, he does have the postmodern character arc. You know, was coward turned brave. You know, didn't want to kill a found, didn't want to kill the smiling tiny, but didn't end up killing her or dying killing her. Uh, again, but not that much depth to him, not that much character, not that much uh, screen time, but, you know, very, you know, there, you know, there, as a postmodern character arc, and, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, Armin, this is a great picture of him, too. Great as in it fits this, fits this character. Uh, I put him in S-tier. I put him in S-tier because, um, he, like Aaron, has a bunch of weird character arcs where some go backwards, some in the same, some go forwards. Um, Aaron uh, Armin was the free, is the freest character in the show, right? He's the freest because he, um, unlike let's actually bring up see if we have, uh, what's his face, Papa Jaeger as Fox and Anime calls him. Yeah, I'm just gonna call him Papa Jaeger. Can't, can't find him here. Unlike Papa Jaeger, who's complicit with being inside the walls and, and being trapped. And unlike Aaron, who was in, in is, is Aaron here? I, I didn't never, I, it just occurred to me, I did not even see him. Where is Aaron? Hold on a second. Don't tell me I had this giant list and Aaron's not here. Oh, he is here, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry for that, I just gotta make sure. Uh, Mel and, and he's not having an insatiable um, embittering uh, sense of freedom or thirst for freedom like Aaron does, right? He falls in the perfect yet hard to reach middle where he still is satisfied with his life in the present because he still can genuinely enjoy trivial things and there's things about his life that are that are good and well, but he also has aspirations of the future and his main, you know, what he's drunk on is curiosity. So, and of course, since his time on this earth is finite, which is Aaron's greatest weakness, it's actually Aaron, Armin's greatest strength because that means that he's guaranteed to always have something for his dream. So, I always say, you know, when, want, when he sees the ocean, he's like, and, and, and Isayama said this as well, when he sees the ocean, he's like, oh great, this is something more I can explore, my life can get better, but he's still perfectly happy inside the walls, right? But he also wants to see the ocean because it's still there, right? So, it's just, it's really, really cool, really, really good character writing, and we also see him progress from being a sweet, you know, boy who gets, you know, we feel bad for him and gets bullied, to, you know, slaughtering, bur burning people to death and all this other stuff, and another thing I like about him is that we constantly see how, you know, it was a better decision to pick, we had, I mean, we had living rooms divided over whether it should be Armin or Erwin, and pick Armin, and once in his life, Erwin actually says something pretty intelligent, and he proves why Armin should be the one who gets the Colossal, and, you know, and Armin also 
um, you know, uh, is proven time and time again that he should have gotten the Colossal over over Erwin. And also, another thing about him is that he's also a really good diplomat as well. That's another thing that we that's another led to his character that he's a diplomat. And he's really good at, you know, talking, finding peace, finding understanding, you know, very intelligent guy. So, yeah, very, very, very good character. Freest character in the entire show. No one is more free than him because he is constantly um, uh, curious. He wants to do other stuff. He, has, he does have dreams that he that he's drunk on, right? Seeing the ocean will be one of them. What is the ocean? Okay, what's the next thing, right? But he also can genuinely enjoy good moments in the present without, you know, it interfacing with his dream, right? It's sort of like if you're going on a drive to a theme park. Yeah, you want to go to a theme park. Of course, you want to go to a theme park. But you also are. Hey, look at that tree. That's a pretty cool sight. Oh, I'm enjoying this right now. Oh, you know, it's kind of relaxing to be in this drive. Oh, look at the sunset. Right, look at the stars. You know, you know what I mean. Like, and just enjoying the drive. Aaron's like, when am I gonna get to the theme park? Why get to the theme park? We came here get to the theme park. It's taking too long. Why get to the theme park? That's Aaron, right? You know, Papa Yeager's like, oh, the car got broken down. I mean, hey, you know, it's just pretty cool in this car. We can sleep in this car. Right, so that's a, that's a, I think that's a perfect analogy for how um, Armin is. It's a very, very, very well done character here. Uh, Reiner. Now everyone loves to uh, say Reiner's the best written character in Titan Titan. I disagree. Um, I, Reiner is a great character. I'm not gonna say he's not a great character. He's a great character, but um, you know he gets way too much credit. But he, he is a very well written character. I actually can might put him. I actually give him an A tier, A plus tier. Uh, you know, very good character, very good character writing. You know, um, and as Redirk pointed out, he actually created two personalities. He did not create one personality. He created two: the warrior and the soldier, both fake personalities. Um, you have a very, very complex psychology going there. Again, if you want, if you want, I'm, I'm not the guy who's going to give you this full scoop on that. Go to Redirk's channel and and look at that. Uh, yeah, shout out to him. He made a very, very good video about that, about that and psychology of Reiner. Um, but what, what I can tell you is that, you know, he has this, the, you know, the postmodern character arc, you know, the, the bad guy turned good guy. He struggles with suicide and guilt and stuff, and he wants to, you know, please his dad, but he has to move forward from that. But his mom, he can't, because his mom was a horrible person in his entire life, and then, you know, finally after Aaron's sacrifice, she came around, you know, and he was able to reconcile that relationship with her. And he had to work through his mental illness and stuff like that. Again, I'm not going to spend too long time on Reiner. You already know the deal with Reiner. And, you, again, you can check out Redirk's video. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, he basically very... His his best... The best thing about him is, is his uh, exploration to human psychology. Right? Uh, so, yeah, very, very good there uh, on his part. All right, next, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'll put you in the same tier as him, you know. We don't really see him now. Who is this? Is this Laos? I think this is Laos. Yeah, I don't remember much from her, so I'll also put her on the same tier. Again, these are people taking much screen time. Did have important dialogue, but did take much screen time. Uh, Annie Lanhart. I wish I had my cup here. Uh, but, yeah. Annie Lanhart is actually... I'm actually going to put her in... Hmm, should I put her in S tier? No. I, should, I can't. Uh, Annie Lanhart. Now, <laughs> I know. I know you guys are all angry at me again. Right? Uh, f uh, but for people who, you know, love to complain about how, you know, uh, sexist Isayama is for how he writes female characters, it sure is funny to see whenever someone tries to say this character role we're in how angry you guys get. Uh, but just, just some food for thought. But Annie Lanehart is a great character, and if you want to know my f full thoughts, which are like 40 minutes long, you can go check out my video, uh, Annie, uh, I think it's actually around 30 minutes long. Uh, Annie Lanehart character analysis. So you can go check that out. Uh, basically, uh, what makes her really, 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 really good, uh, and separate from Reiner and her partner in crime, who's somewhere around here, I don't, I don't know where he is, uh, is that she, um, she does feel, um, she's not, um, she's, again, she's in between Reiner and Zeke, right? You see this with Armin, like, he's in between, uh, Papa Jaeger and Aaron, he, she's in between uh, Reiner and Zeke. On the one hand, Zeke is perfectly happy slaughtering people, doing whatever he wants, because that's that's psychology, right? Uh, Reiner knows. See, Reiner knows who's doing this. So he, he Reiner was doing this so he can get praise that he knew he did not deserve, and he knew he didn't deserve it even be, even more because Marshall told him that he fudged the numbers. So, uh, yeah, poor, poor, poor guy. 
So Reiner feels incredibly guilty because he knows he did, he did all this for selfish reasons and he fooled himself into thinking it. So he was he feels completely responsible. Zeke, on the other hand, does that feel that way? And he's in the middle. See, and people confuse people confuse what's with nuance and layering with they're so simplistic that they make this more than it is. Um Yeah. So uh Annie actually um Contra Prep Belief does feel guilty about what she does, and she's not very not the happiest person in the world about having to um, slaughter these people. But, 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 but she said she'd do it all over again. So, so, uh, so would Aaron. Aaron also would do the rumbling all over again if the, all the events played out like they played out. But he still feels guilty about the rumbling. Wait, you guys said the same thing about Aaron. Never mind. You guys can't be reasoned with. Uh, we obviously see her again express guilt. I think it's actually. Yeah, no, this is uh, actually, yeah. Even in this picture, she's so she, she just go. It's you know, I, I wish I could find. I really wish I could find the quote. I tried to find this quote so much, but I cannot find it. But um, he says that when she was laughing or she she smiled, it was depending on how you watch the end. And it was, it, one of the reasons she was laughing was you know she was um, relieved to find been caught, right? Because you know she was sort of like the same thing with Bear with uh, Reiner. Where he wants to be punished in a way, sort of the same thing, not as extreme as Rainer, but sort of, you know, she could stop now. She could stop a lying to people, but and you know, she would so she would stop deceiving them, and she could, you know, now uh, complete her mission and her mission's almost over, right? So we see, you know, that she's apologizing to a corpse in Strauss when he thinks no one's there, and then you know, Rainer says contrition does you no good. And all that stuff, and then of course, um, we uh, we see her. Uh, well, the woods scene, which uh, the reason I installed the scene is because you could say it was about her father, which again, yeah, I agree with it was about her father, but it's more than that, I would say. But yeah, uh, definitely is not the happiest person in the world. And again, in Lost Girls, which again is not canon, but the spin offs do reference the main material a lot, for example. Uh, Levi's Levi's Vexor is referenced in the, the the manga and the ring that Annie has is um, Mikasa knows <laughs> Mikasa knows about the ring because when she sees the ring she takes Armin and Aaron they book it because in Lost Girl she sees Annie with the ring in when she's doing they're peeling the potatoes and another <laughs> cool thing that no one actually picked up on was um, 2017 which, which was when Lost Girls came out. Uh, and yes, I know I'm making a contradiction here, but it doesn't matter. 2017, when Lost Girls came out, and when uh, season two came out, uh, she, was, she was eating donuts, and Sasha said that she's heard that Annie like sweet things, referring to, uh, you know, Lost Girls. So, what what, what I mean to say is that um, this is reference, and also the leg injury. There's a lot of stuff, but and we know some stuff isn't canon. For example, Annie's fall is completely different in. Um, in the canon than in the than, than, than Lost Girls, and I mean Mikasa's thing is a dream, so we, we don't need to talk about that. Uh, but uh, she does express a much much more guilt in Lost Girls because it's in her inner dialogue. She's saying she needs to distract herself from becoming a soldier. She doesn't want to do it. You know, she said that she hopes it wouldn't happen at the end when, when they're peeling the potatoes, all this stuff. So yeah, so uh, you know, <laughs> that's why I say she doesn't feel guilty. If you still think she, if you still think that she's just a heartless killer. You know, wh wh whatever. There's no use reasoning with you, but she also does not regret her decision because she knew what she was doing. She had the wisdom beforehand. As I said in my other video, she said to that her, to Aaron that her father got caught, and I feel that had nothing to do with the real world, which would be the you know the racism between the, the Marlins and the Eldians. And she also says to Reiner, which is in the past, um, that the Marlins and the Eldians are both bad people, and there's no difference between the two. So she knew what she was doing, so of course she wouldn't regret it, because she, she, she knew what she was doing going into it. And another thing that I'd like to mention, everyone is all upset about her, you know, how un, you know, how un, you know, repentant she is and all that sort of stuff. The funny thing is that everyone's fine with Aaron killing, you know, 80% of the world for his friends or his island or whatever, but she, they're not fine with Annie killing a significantly less number of people. For the exact same reason, right? She wants to get back to her mother's father. And some people say, whoa, she, went, she wants to go back to her abusive father? How terrible. Well, Ryan wants to go back to his mom. And Zeke wants, like, uh, it does love, it didn't want to go back to, but loved his dad. And I'm sure there's more examples down the line. But 
uh, yeah, those are the two I can think of right off, the top, right off the top of my head. So, it's not bad for her to like a bad person. Otherwise, who would be loved then? Honestly. I just want you know, we're never going to get into that. But, uh, yeah, so that's why she's a well written character. Because she shows a villain who genuinely does feel sorry and does not want to do things. But also, um, is still going to do them anyway. Because she, she believes it's the right thing. She believes that's the right thing to do. As the song says, believe in yourself firmly is the right thing to do. Um, and so on and so forth, and yeah. So, and another thing about her character is that without creating any plot holes or retcons, he actually makes her help the Alliance, because he has to make her help the Alliance, right? But how does he How does he do this? How does he make any help the Alliance? She can't help them because she's drunk and seeing her father. So what does he do? To make her develop, right? She has the same, you know, quick spike. To make her develop, what he does is he, um... And he thinks her father is dead, so she's able to move past what she was drunk on before. And also, she did want to do something genuinely good, because she's, she's tired of sinning, she wants to do something genuinely good. And so to, you know, sort of to make up for her sins, not really, but to sort of do something good in the world. And because her motivation, her primary motivation has been lost, now she can help the Alliance, and she gets her father at the same time. And she gets her sight in con. So, very good character enough for her. Very consistent character, again. Uh, lots of lots of people would be tempted to do the postmodern character arc and make her feel all sorry and repentant. Maybe you know, I, I don't know. People are angry about her not being you know her fault that being dead because it'd be the it'd be the perfect punishment for her because she she'd know how it feels to lose a loved one and all that sort of nonsense. But they'd be tempted to most writers would be tempted to do that, but um, doing so would create massive plot holes because, again, she knew exactly what she was doing. That was the entire point of her character. So, very, very nice stuff there. And with that, I'm going to end the video. Uh, we are going to do a part two. So, uh, catch me at part two. So, let's actually look at the character list right now. This is what it looks like right now. Yeah, you can see it there. And catch me for part two.